All right, everyone, welcome to Wednesday, uh, which Wednesday at noon Eastern time means it's time for a what's new at one schoolhouse webinar and I'm excited to have with me here today my colleague and friend Liz Cates to talk about something that we're talking about a lot these days, which is resilience. I'm Sarah Hanawald, Assistant Head of School for Professional Development here at One Schoolhouse. And I'm um, just gonna talk a little bit, do some framing, and then we are gonna get into this. We really seek input on this particular topic. So if you've got something to share, please drop that in the chat. Or if you've got a question or just something that you wanna make sure we address, put that in the Q&A for us today. Thank you. Um, so on our blog, Leading Communities into Resilience, this one um, I wrote and the research for this was fascinating. And I, there are a couple of links in the blog that I would encourage you to look at, particularly some research around the importance of personal networks in resilience. And I also had to do some redefining of resilience for myself as I did that research and more about that later. Next week's webinar, we're really gonna focus in some ways on resilience again, but with kids in mind, with students in mind, and we're gonna think about what student support is gonna look like in the next normal. Just wanna remind everybody, as I do often, the advanced independent curriculum is available on our website. We would love for you to download it. We'd love feedback. Um, join us for professional learning opportunities around advanced independent curriculum. Um, we also have a course called Technology Considerations for Academic Leaders. As schools have ramped up their technological capacity. What does this mean from the academic point of view and how can academic leaders really shape and guide the use of technology in the next normal? Um, summer professional learning. We're gonna talk a little bit more about this as we go through this webinar. Reflect, Restore and Renew, which is a course for academic leaders. And then we have a course with the same title for teachers. That is about um, what we need to restore ourselves and build our resilience and be ready for next year and how we can help guide those around us in that same action. And then we've also got Building Trust, which is a course for academic leaders. This has been a year in which professional trust has sometimes been frayed or eroded through no fault of any individuals, but what can academic leaders do when they need to get those professional relationships repaired and restored for their communities. So I'm adding a new feature this week. We, every week in our newsletter, we have a Pulse survey and I'll drop the link in the chat in just a minute if you haven't had a chance to complete it yet. But this week we asked, how are you rebuilding trust and connection in your community? And there's lots of time still to put your answer in, but I made a word cloud out of some of the responses so far. Super interesting to me that the two most common responses are not sure and listening. So I think that folks are dead on, right? Listening is one of the most important things a leader can do. And then not being sure and being willing to say that you're not sure what to do is probably, um, Brene Brown would be proud as you channel some vulnerability there. All right, oops, Liz, I'm gonna hold this one. I'm gonna save that one. I'm gonna stop sharing and we've got a couple of slides. Usually we just talk and I finish my slides and then we go. So Liz, thank you so much for joining me today. And one of the things that we have been um, finding out is that there are some, there is a map. We used to say we don't really know what's going to happen this month, and you found out that there is a map. So, can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So, this is um, my um, this is my my big takeaway from the pandemic. Um, so, when I was doing some research, as you said, about you know how humans are 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 reacting these days, what I discovered is that actually there are very well defined and um, and well-supported evidence for the fact that people go through, um, I'll use the word disaster here because that's what's used in the literature, um, go, th go through and recover from disaster. So um, for when we were going around a year ago saying there's no map, there's no map, it turns out there's a map. Um, and it's actually 
posted on um, the United States Health and Human Services Department website. Um, and Sarah, I think I sent you the link that we can put in there so that folks can go take a look at that diagram. But oh, you can, it. yeah, you can take a look. Um, and if you'll go to the slide, mm -hmm. um, we can talk about what those six stages are. Right, here we go. And I'll get that link in the chat while you okay. share that. Um, so the first phase is pre-disaster phase. This is some disasters get a pre-disaster phase. Um, I think that when you look at sort of what the global um, the global spread of COVID-19 is, we certainly had in the United States a pre-disaster phase where we could anticipate that we would be affected by it, but it was not here yet. Um, sometimes there is no pre-disaster phase in the case of an earthquake. Sometimes it's a few hours or maybe even a few days. And if, uh, if you're looking at a wildfire, um, it really runs the gamut. But what's important there is that you're experiencing fear and uncertainty. And then when you hit um, the impact phase, that's it's shock, it's panic, it's confusion, and the focus is on self-preservation and family protection. You, it's like you get tunnel vision. Only you are only focused on what is most important and taking care of what is most important to you. As the impact phase passes, then you hit what's called the heroic phase, um, and this is when there's high activity from both um, people who are affected and people who, who are coming in to um, help with the rescuers. Um, but it's high activity without a lot of productivity for people who are most affected. So if you think about what this meant for us, you can think back to the spring of 2020 um, with uh, people banging pots and pans and cheering um, from their windows for healthcare workers, almost all of whom were inside hospitals and care facilities. So that as the bystanders, we felt like we were doing something meaningful, but it didn't actually help the situation that was there. Um, from there, as the scope of the disaster becomes clear, you enter the honeymoon phase, which doesn't mean that things are great. <laughs> so it's sort of a funny, uh, a funny term here. What it does mean is that the assistance that's available is actually responding to the needs of the disaster. Um, and that there's this sense, okay, we're going to get through it. That's the community bonding moment and the, the optimism. Um, you know, we can, you know, we're, we're, we're all in this together. And let me also say that there are very few disasters when everybody is in it together in the same situation, even if everybody is experiencing it. Um, but the sense that you'll be able to handle it. And then the disillusionment phase hit, uh, sets in. And that's the sense that I will never be the same again. The sense that I that that recovery is so much bigger and harder than I than I ever understood. So you get those feelings of abandonment. You, that's also where you see maladaptive coping strategies, which is basically anything that makes you feel better short term that isn't actually going to make you better in the long term. So like adaptive coping is getting enough sleep and healthy eating and exercise. Maladaptive coding, coping is eating junk food and, um, you know, binging on Netflix. Um, it does. It absolutely helps in that moment. Don't get me wrong. Did it myself a few times. Um, <laughs> but also it doesn't actually contribute to my wellness and, or my ability to manage the situation. And so that can be really something unhealthy, mimicking as something healthy. So the person who becomes the binge exerciser, for yep, example. That can happen too. Something adaptive can tip over into being maladaptive. And disillusionment lasts a long time. Um, so if you look at, um, if, you, if you do get a chance to take a look at that, um, that diagram that's on the HHS site. What you see is that disillusionment is a long, slow, choppy up and down path upwards because it gets better and then it gets a little worse and then it gets better and it gets a little worse. Um, and that 
you will hit events that whether they're anniversaries, that's a big one that sort of send you back down or, you know, that there's some kind of milestone that sets you back or some kind of progress that moves you forward. And as you emerge from disillusionment, you reach reconstruction, which is the sense that we are, that, that, that we are now recovering and that there is a new way of doing things, but, but that I am reaching what, what I can expect to see moving forward, that I'm reaching a new kind of stability. Um, this comes from, I do wanna quickly just say that this comes from the research of um, two researchers um, called uh, Zunin and Myers, um, who uh, talk about grief and recovery um, as well as trauma. Um, there's also, Sarah, one more thing that you can put in there, which is um, from a, um, that's about specifically what these phases look like for children and families that may be useful um, to those of you who deal with, um, with, it'll work for everybody, but it's especially useful for probably for people who work with parents of elementary and middle school students. Great, so I put that one in as well. Um, we're going to turn the slides off for a little bit, and then we have a couple of others to share as well as we go further in. So, Liz, one of the things that I learned, and, you know, I taught high school English for a little while and some middle school English, so I like definitions and I like thinking about what exactly words mean, and I know you share that with me, so thank you. Um, I was not totally on about what resilience means, and I think you know, that has helped me in reflecting in the course that we're building to, to help academic leaders help their communities. So resilience to me was the adaptability that someone might show during a crisis. And while that is one definition, what it's really about is your ability after the crisis to return to a healthy way of functioning. And so if we talk about just a substance, resilience is the ability to to go back to its former shape after being under some kind of stressor. And then if we're thinking about people, it's not about going back exactly to who you were, but going forward and going forward in a way that lets you be who you're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And that's tough. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. So um, it's important to note that there is a difference between uh, I'll use the word trauma here, between personal trauma and collective trauma, which is that, um, that the personal trauma is something that affects you and your way of the world. And a collective trauma is something that affects everybody. We have all gone through a collective trauma in the past 14 months. And some of us have gone through personal trauma. Others have gone through really, really difficult things that may not rise to the level of trauma. Um, but it's important to understand that there's two different levels of what's going on as we think about resilience. Um, and also that there's a difference between the disaster and the crisis, right? If you look at that map, which is that, that, that we usually think of the disaster as just the impact phase, but in fact, the crisis of that disaster stretches far beyond the boundaries of whatever that whatever the moment was. And, you know, it's really clear what the disaster was when it's an earthquake, right? Mm -hmm. um, when this year, we, you could say that this was essentially 18 months and there were moments when it was acute and there were moments when it was a lull. Um, for those of us who had family members or loved ones who, or ourselves were sick, then that long-term collective trauma is not nearly as important as the personal one. You know, that, that what happened when, when, you were, when you were caring for or concerned about, about people's survival. Survival is different than, than a collective experience. So resilience looks really different then too, doesn't it? Some kids' yeah. resilience isn't going to emerge until next year. And some kids' breakdowns may not emerge until... Exactly we get into next year. Yeah, so, you know, this is the moment to acknowledge, to, to pull from a pandemic cliche that um, we were all in the same storm, but we were in different boats. So if your boat arrived at shore with, you know, 
with the sense that, gosh, I really love baking sourdough bread every week, and that is your pandemic takeaway, that, that is a valid and true experience, but it's not the same as somebody who had family members who passed away or who was a frontline healthcare worker. So we didn't go through the same and we are not going to complete the same crises, even though we were all part of the same collective disaster. Um, and as a community, schools are not going to serve families well by minimizing. Um, and by minimizing and making the assumption that everybody had the same experience over the past eight months. Yeah, one of the things that you and I talked about when we were getting ready for this is that schools are really good at appreciative inquiry. We look for the strengths in a scenario and what went right. And that's usually a good thing. You know, it's, it's one of our superpowers. Um, we help find and identify strengths and build on those, but we have to be, be cautious here because sometimes we are having conversations where we're looking at a strength and saying, wow, this child's executive functioning skills, you know, really developed as they took care of three younger siblings. And we need to honor the fact that to that family, that, that may not be worth celebrating. I mean, that's not what they wanted their child to do. And so it's not that we don't want to recognize these strengths, but we have to tread super cautiously. Absolutely. Um, you know, and let's acknowledge right now that students and are required to face things all the time that they shouldn't have to. And that those some of those things are systemic, like racism and poverty. Um, and some of them are personal, like abuse or trauma. Um, and so this is also part of that long, long story of, um, of kids who have to manage grown up size problems. Um, and yes, kids grow from that experience. And it's also painful, challenging, and can sometimes have lifelong implications. That's, that's just true. Um, and so when we think about, about how students um, how students and families and adults, because of course, teachers are not, teachers are people too, right? They're not, they don't, they're, much as your um, kindergartner doesn't believe it, they continue to have a life once they leave your campus, um, is that the stress and anxiety of what's going, uh, of managing all these things will stick with us for a long time. Yeah. And Leslie Fry, who is uh, one of our colleagues here at One Schoolhouse and who was on a webinar about a month ago, and I, if you didn't get to see that, I'll drop the link in the chat as well. She talked about the importance of recognizing on campus all of these different places at the same time and what a juggle that can be for an academic leader, um, keeping track of so many folks at the same time. And I'm going to ask you a question that has been on my mind lately because we've talked about stress and anxiety together. In fact, I bet if you Google them as a phrase, they show up over and over again, but they're really not the same thing. Can you talk a little bit about the distinction? Yeah, um, so, so the first is that stress is normal and it's not always bad. Um, that little jolt you get um, before you sit down to, uh, to an exam or before you give a presentation, that's stress but it's there revving you up so that you do a great job, right? Stress, stress isn't always bad. Um, and too much stress is almost always bad. Um, so it's important to be able to make the distinction between stress and the stressor. The stressor is the thing that is causing you stress and you can't control the stressor. It is out of your control, but the stress, is something that you can examine and address the way you handle. That is not to say that if you feel stressed, it's your fault. Um, that's everybody has a stress threshold at which point that there's no way to positively cope with it. It just gets overwhelming. Um, but that when you can separate, when you can understand 
the difference between what's happening internally and what's happening externally, that's a really useful psychological moment. Um, and anxiety is essentially the, I'll use the same word earlier, maladaptive strategy that, um, that emerges when, when you're trying to figure out how to handle stress that feels overwhelming. Yeah, and so Lisa Damore has two handouts um, that are available for sharing within your community, one about stress and one about anxiety. And I'm gonna put both of those in the chat as well. And I think when we think about situations and systems and how they cause burnout, they're external. And then the recovery, as, as you touched on just now, it, it begins internally. And I think there's an important distinction there because we hear exhortions to manage your reactions as if a stress-induced ailment is the individual's fault. Now, remember when we used to think ulcers were caused by people's maladaptive uh, stress. And then I think, you know, medicine made some good advances. <laughs> Right. <laughs> so I'm sure that that is not the intent of any well-meaning or colleague, you know, take a walk, get some more vitamin D. Um, but there's a risk that our message comes across as judgment when we give advice on adaptive strategies. So can you talk a little bit more about how important it is to maybe just say that often? Yeah. And I'm going to put the link for anxiety into it. I put the stress one in. That so bad. Yeah. <laughs> So this is where I go back to that, um, to, to this, to the, we are all in the same storm and we are all in different boats. Um, and one of the things as we look forward to the year that's coming is that um, we will all be changed by this experience that we went through. There, there is no way we couldn't be. We will be changed as individuals, we will be changed as communities, and we will be changed as a culture. Um, and some of those changes will probably feel great and some of them will probably feel terrible. That's just what we can, what, what the law of averages tells us will happen, right? Um, and it's important to remember as we look forward to understand that the storm will still be happening. For many of for for many of our community, um, so I am uh, reminded of uh, being in a school community when a student uh, uh, died suddenly um, in a car accident, and what a counselor told the community is: what you have to understand is that this will bring up. That, that when you are faced with mortality and with, and, with, um, and with grief in this way, it surfaces all your other things, whether or not they're related to mortality and grief and sadness, sort of you, it's, um, you know, humans are pretty good at compartmentalizing. And so when you open one spot to sort of do that, where you have to do that emotional work, it brings up other things. And so the, as we emerge from what the past 16 months have been, we are going to have to process loss on lots of different levels and in lots of different contexts. Um, even if those were not things that were operative before the pandemic. Thank you. Um, I think one of the risks for those in helping professions is something called secondary trauma. And <clears throat> excuse me, fortunately, that is not typical in teaching, but you know, there are levels that build up to that. And compassion fatigue and demoralization are real risks for teachers. So those are some things that we're going to. Um, look into more in some of the courses that we do this summer. But beyond that, you and I put together some questions for academic leaders. And so we're going to share our slides again. And I got a question that I'm going to ask you, Liz, while I bring this slide back up. And then I'll just remind everybody, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. But this question, Liz, is how do we know that those phases of disaster really apply to something like COVID? Um, 
so you can actually track the map of the pand you can you can see these things happening if you go back but it's also important to realize that it um it is a cycle and so that you know that that we went through these in macrocosm and we went through them in microcosm so that even if we were in the disillusionment phase when um you had um, a family member get sick, all of a sudden you were back in impact. Um, so we go through that, that this has been um, a sort of funny, that if I were to draw this as a line, I would still have those mountains and valleys, but I would put these loops in there too. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, kind of like a spiral curriculum where you run into the same idea over and over just in different contexts, we went through this over and over again, some of us. Some of us went through it once and some of us went through this a dozen different times. It really, those different boats, they are really different depending on where you live in the United States. Um, and, and let's also put out that, that we in the United States are at a very different phase of this than most of the rest of the world is right now. Um, that, um, you know, that, that we, I'm sorry, I just totally lost my train of thought. Um, <laughs> that is okay because we're going to go on to these questions. And I think these Thank questions you. that we collected for academic leaders are actually going to address this as well. And then, um, I think the other thing, Liz, as we get into this, is that when you were doing this research, it was astounding to you, and you shared that with us, how many people are deeply researching the psychology of disaster response? Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's, it's if you go into, and you start looking at the research of grief and trauma, um, you find all of these things that are really that that are um, that connect to the experience that we've had, and and quite frankly, I found it deeply reassuring. I found it deeply reassuring to to see that even when I felt like I was at that deep disillusionment moment, that I was actually on the path to reconstruction, that I had to pass through disillusionment to get there. So we would definitely encourage academic leaders to to grab that link and to share some of this research on campus. So five questions to consider in fortifying campus resilience. This first one is, do you as an academic leader on campus, are you connected into your network of support that you need in order to build your resilience? And on the blog post that I mentioned some studies on how critical those networks are. And this year can be very isolating for campus adults. And so even if we were able to be open on campus, we didn't necessarily have those support systems built in, the casual coffees with the team, those kinds of things. So making sure, you know, it's an analogy we've used a lot, you can't pour from an empty cup, as Leslie Fry would say, or secure your oxygen mask first, as the flight attendants would tell us. So if, if you've built your network and you're relying on that, how do you help others build theirs? right? The folks who are looking to you to help them. Can you be intentional about that? And that again, um, I would recommend listening to Leslie's work on how to build those teams on campus. And Liz, can you talk a little bit about this critical need for empathy? And it relates to what you've been saying about we're not all in the same boat, even though we're in the same crisis. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I go back to that word cloud you pulled up at the beginning, the importance of listening um, you know, really take the time to hear people's stories. So um, understanding those myriad experiences in your community is only going to happen when you're listening and when you go in with the expectation that you're going to hear something that's different from what you experienced. Um, so that, that open-hearted listening um, is a key way for um, for to build connection too. When right. people feel listened to and heard, and this is part of that research that, that you looked at um, for the blog this week, Sarah, when people feel listened to and heard, they are better able 
to access their own resilience. Right. And you know who's really an expert that in that is Lori Palco, who is a professional coach and a former independent school teacher and administrator. Um, I'm going to plug her course, Building Trust, but she can really lay out the path for how to hold those conversations in such a way that you can help others reclaim their agency. You know, if someone feels like they don't have it anymore, how do they reclaim it? And that's what they need in order to build their resilience. So taking a look, where do those professional relationships need reinforcing and rebuilding? And there is so much you have to do at once as an academic leader. It's simultaneous. We have to get to August. We have to get to graduation 2022. And also we're supposed to be thinking about 2027, 2032, all of those all at the same time. So understanding your capacity and your strategies for all of that simultaneous work. And we've run a minute over. And if you know me, you know, I like to wrap things up on time. So I'm going to stop sharing. And I want to say thank you, Liz. This has been a really um, interesting conversation. You and I have been doing a lot of research kind of on parallel tracks, and it was really nice to pull it together for this webinar. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you for coming. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.